Hi, I'm Casey. Welcome back to the I Heart Latin channel, lesson number three, where we are going to talk about third declension nouns, appositives, and we'll also talk about the use of the word there. So let's get started. Third declension nouns. So real quickly, when we're thinking about nouns, remember that they are going to belong to one of five families, and we call those families declensions. Whatever family they belong to, whether it's a first declension noun, second, third, fourth, fifth, it's always going to belong to that family. And what I mean by that is if there's a noun from the first declension, it'll never have third declension endings, for example, and vice versa is true. Uh, so let's look at this list over here. Now, nouns of the third declension are the trickiest, in my opinion, for a couple different reasons. Uh, the first reason is they can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. So remember that nouns of the first declension are generally feminine. Nouns of the second declension are generally masculine. Kind of have a handful of neuter ones there, but mostly masculine. Nouns of the third declension, however, are all over the board. They can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. How do we know if they're masculine, feminine, or neuter, since they're all in the same family and kind of one big mush pot? Here are the rules to determining whether a noun from the third declension is masculine, feminine, or neuter. So just like the first and second declension, um, when you see a noun of the third declension listed, you will see two versions. You're gonna see the nominative singular and the genitive singular. If you look at the nominative singular, you might notice here that uh, the, the, the endings are kind of all over the board. Um, this one ends in an X, this one in an OR, an OIS, et cetera, et cetera. So to determine what gender a noun of the third declension is, you look at the ending of the nominative singular. If it ends in an ER or an, o, or an OR, it's masculine. So just remember the word error. If it ends in ER or OR, it's masculine. So for instance, Imperator, which means commander, this is a masculine word. If it ends in an S, an O, or an X, it's feminine. So for instance, the word lex, legis, which means law, we'll see here that the nominative singular ends in an X, that means it's feminine. And if it ends in an L, A, N, C, E, or T, we use the acronym Lancet, that means that it's neuter. So for instance, this word here at the bottom, flumen, fluminous meaning river, you see that the nominative singular ends in an N, that means that it's neuter. And it kind of goes to reason a little bit, a river isn't masculine or feminine, it's, it doesn't really have a gender, it's just neuter. So sometimes these things kind of follow logic, not always. Um, but this is th these are the three acronyms to remember for the third declension, error, socks, lancet. So again, error is masculine, Sox is feminine, lancet is neuter. Any noun whose genitive singular ends in is belongs to the third declension. Um, the same rules apply. So if we wanna find the stem for a third declension noun, we're gonna look at this, the, um, the genitive singular and we're going to drop the is from the genitive singular. So if you look at the genitive singular, you notice that that pattern stays the same. All of these words end in is, and so all we need to do to find the stem is to drop the is in all of the genitive singular, and that will give us our stem. So my stem for lex legis would be what? L-E-G, and then I would put the appropriate ending on. For imperator, imperatoris, it would be imperator. For a homo hominis, um, it would be homin, like this, homin, and then I would put the ending on there. Uh, host, hostess would be host, etc., etc. Now, you might notice as we go through this list, all of these words follow these rules except which one? Okay, so lex is feminine, right? Imperator is masculine, but I get to this word, homo hominis, if I look at my nominative singular here, it ends in an O, right? What, what should, what gender should this word be? Well, according to the rule, it should be feminine, right? But the word means man, actually kind of more like mankind. Um, but again, just kind of like in the first declension, if the word refers to a traditionally masculine person or thing, then it would be masculine even if it does even if it is following the socks rule. Does that make sense to everybody? So um, again, just keep in mind if the word is referring to a specific gender, 
then it's going to follow that gender rule, not necessarily the error fox lancet rule. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have a question, you can leave it in the comments. <laughs> I'll get back to you as soon as I humanly can. OK, um, if you have your handy dandy declension cheat sheet, cheat sheet, <laughs> pull it out. Um, and we're going to be looking at these two green boxes here. I will put a link in the description. If you don't already have this, you can print it out. It's pretty handy to have. Um, I usually keep it next to me when I'm doing exercises. Um, the nice thing about the masculine and feminine in the third declension is they are declined the same way. So whether a word is masculine or feminine, it's going to have the exact same ending. So you don't have to worry about um, a set of different endings, whether a word is masculine or feminine, same. The neuter, however, does have slightly different endings. So we'll talk about those in just a minute. But I want you to look here first, um, starting at the top left. So you'll see in the nominative singular, in parentheses, you'll see V-A-R period. And what that stands for is various, meaning there are so many different endings in the nominative singular in the third declension, it would, it would be too much to try to cram them into that little space. There's a lot of various endings, right? Could be ER, could be OR, could be SOX, could be L-A-N-C-E-T. So usually you'll see that word various standing in there, just letting you know there's a lot of different options for nouns um, in the third declension. And then as we move through here, you'll see it's is, e, m, a, s, um, ibis, s, ibis. That's the masculine and feminine. Now, if we look at the neuter option, you'll again see the word various, various, is, e, and then again, you'll notice in the accusative singular, you see the word various again. So what that means is that the accusative singular is exactly the same as the nominative singular. So for instance, um, flumen, that's a neuter, third declension noun. So if I needed to um, plug in the accusative singular of the word flumen, fluminous, I would use the same spelling as the nominative singular. So it would just be flumen, same thing. So these, th this is exactly the same thing. Um, and then you'll see in the plural column, a, um, ibis, a, ibis. Okay. Now, not to overly confuse everybody, but I do want to point out that you'll see this little I here. If you look at the genitive plural in the third declension, you'll see an I in parentheses. So it says um, and then you'll see that little I in parentheses. So there is a rule that if you have a noun of the, in the third declension and two things, the nominative singular and the genitive singular have the same number of syllables. So for instance, hostess, hostess, both the nominative singular and the genitive singular have two syllables, hostess, hostess. Or the nominative singular ends in a double consonant. So for instance, the word pars partis, you'll see the nominative singular ends in rs, all right, pars partis. Then if you needed to use a form of the word that was genitive plural, you would use eum instead of um. So if, um, so for instance, it would be hostium, not hostum, and it would be partium, not partum. Again, um, just something to kind of keep in mind. I know sometimes I think, gosh, whoever made up Latin, were they trying to make it super difficult? <laughs> and I know that, you know, every language has its own rules and exceptions, but I know it's difficult when you're starting out to keep all these things in mind. But just kind of put that in the back of your brain when you're doing your work. Just remember that there are some exceptions in the third declension. Okay, so let's look at the sentence I have here. The general praises the enemy's laws. So again, if you have your little question ID uh, cheat sheet, this will help us identify what role, which words are playing in this sentence. Um, I will put a link in the description. Uh, if you don't know how to identify what role these nouns are playing and also the verb, uh, this will help you. Okay, so if I look at the first question, let me find the subject first. So who or what is this sentence about? It's about the general, right? The general is the one doing the praising. So the general is my subject. And if I look at my cases here, the nominative case is my subjective case. So this word is nominative. 
Is it singular or plural? It's only one general, right? So it's singular. And what's the last thing we have to remember? GNC, gender, number, case. The word general, is it masculine, feminine, or neuter? Well, if I look at my, lit, my word list here, it ends in an OR. It's talking about, you know, commander is a traditionally male job. Uh, and it follows the rule, so it is indeed masculine. Um, what is the general doing or being? Well, he's praising, there's my verb. The general praises who or what? That's my next question. Do I have a direct object here? The general praises what? The laws. So here's my direct object. If I look at my cases, the direct object is the accusative case. Is the word laws singular or plural? Well, this is plural, right? I'm talking about more than one law. And is the word law masculine, feminine, or neuter? Well, I look at my list. I can see that um, it's feminine because the nominative singular ends in X, and that's my socks rule, so that's feminine. Um, I, know how to I, I know how to find my stem by dropping the IS in the genitive singular. So here's my stem, L-E-G, right? Um, this is feminine. And then what about the word enemies? Okay, so does this answer the question whose, whose laws, as you see down there at the very bottom? It does indeed. So this is my possessive case. And the possessive, if I look over here, this is the genitive case. Um, and just so you know, um, the word enemies is usually always plural. Uh, it's just something you kind of have to remember. So um, in Latin, they use this word plural. This word in particular, they use it um, in a plural way almost exclusively. And is it masculine, and feminine, or neuter? Well, it follows my what? This ends in an S, right? Um, it follows the rule, so it's feminine. Um, OK, just, just so you know, um, there is no such thing as apostrophe S in Latin. They, they wouldn't have a way of saying the enemy's laws. How they would literally say it would be the laws of the enemies. The reason I don't usually write it out like that is because in English, um, if I wrote the laws of the enemies, that would be a preposition and an object of the preposition. It would be a different case. So usually when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching students who don't know anything about Latin, I always start by having them translate like this with an apostrophe S, even though technically this doesn't exist in Latin. Like I said, um, this would, literally be the laws of the enemy. It just helps to, um, you know, not overly confuse people when they're kind of just starting out. Okay, so let's plug in the correct form of the Latin words here. Uh, so general, okay, I have my nominative singular. So I look at my list up here, imperator, imperatoris. So here's my nominative singular, right? So I'm gonna plug this in. It will be imperator. Um, praises the enemy's laws. All right, let's do laws first. So I need an accusative plural ending for the word laws. So I already determined that this is my stem leg. So if I look at my chart, um, we have determined that law, the, the word law, right, lex legis, is feminine. It follows the Sox rule. So that means we're gonna use um, this first block of possible endings here. These are my masculine and feminine endings. Um, we have determined that this is accusative in case and it's plural in number. So I just come down to my accusative plural um, ending here, which is a long E and an S, so S. So this word would be, I plug in my stem, L-E-G, and then I plug in the correct ending, the accusative plural ending, which would be leges. And then I've got one more noun here that I can decline, and that is enemies. So I told you that it's, it's always plural, or at least that's the only way I've ever seen it is plural. Uh, so I have found my, my stem for enemy, right? Host, H-O-S-T. And I look here, I know that host is, is feminine. So I, again, I'm going to use this box right here. It's genitive plural, but remember my rule. If it has um, the same number of syllables in the nominative singular and the genitive singular, it's going to be ium 
IUM and not just UM. So that would be the correct form of that word. Now, if I was really going to write this the way that it appears in Latin, um, it, Latin does tend to have a pattern. It does tend to be subject, object, verb, generally, not always. So if I was going to write this the way it would really appear in Latin, it would be um, imperator. We usually start with the subject. And remember I said the verb comes last. Now we're going to put the direct object first because remember I told you technically they would say this, the laws of the enemy. So in this case, the direct object would come, would, would come before um, the possessive. And you usually see it that way. The possessive will come after the thing that it's possessing. So that's different than English. We usually wouldn't say the books of Mary. We would say Mary's books. We would put our possessive first. They tend to do it the opposite way in Latin. So this is what it would look like. Here's my subject. Here's my direct object. Here's my possessive. Here's my verb. The verb's coming last. Okay. Let's talk about appositives. So if you don't have the printout of the nine different roles nouns can play in a sentence, I'll put the link in the description here. You can print it out. It's kind of helpful to, um, to just kind of have on hand if you're doing exercises. And a positive is a noun that is directly beside or, or, or closely follows another noun or pronoun that describes, that further describes or identifies it. So for instance, if I said, um, my dog Rover um, ran, in this sentence, Rover is in a positive because it's further identifying my dog. I can take the word Rover out and the sentence will remain intact. My dog ran. However, I can't take the word dog out. My rover ran, that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so rover is, is um, it could be removed from the sentence and the sentence would still be grammatically correct. Uh, and that's how it differs from the subject. So if I'm looking at this sentence, um, dog is the subject. This is actually what the sentence is about. It's about my dog. Um, it's about my dog running. And Rover is just telling you a little bit more about my dog. So that's what an appositive is. In Latin, um, they have appositives, just like we do in English. The case that you'll put the appositive in depends on the noun that it's identifying. So let me explain that. Um, if this, if we were going to translate this into Latin, here's the nominative, right? This is the subject. Since this word is telling you more about a, a nominative, a subject, this word would also be in the nominative case. However, if I had a sentence that was, that said, for instance, the general praises my friend, a sailor, in this particular case, let's just kind of go through it step by step. Who or what is this sentence about? It's about the general, right? So here's my nominative. Is it singular or plural? It's singular. Is it masculine, feminine, or neuter? We know that it's masculine. What's the general doing or being? He's praising. So here's my verb. Can I answer the question, the general praises who or what? Absolutely. He's praising my friend, right? Um, so this is my direct object. Here's my accusative. Is it singular or plural? It's singular. The word friend, do you remember what declension it belongs to? It belongs to the second declension. It is masculine. And what about the word sailor? Well, the sailor is just telling you more about my friend, who my friend is, right? So the word sailor in the sentence is in a positive. It's a noun directly beside or close to another noun that further identifies it, okay, or describes it. So in this particular case, this appositive would be in the accusative case because it is identifying a noun that's in the accusative case. Does that make sense to everybody? So appositives can appear um, anywhere in a sentence uh, and the case will depend on the noun they're further describing or identifying. Um, so the word sailor is singular and it is masculine. Um, so if I was going to 
translate this particular sentence into Latin, I would start with the first word, my subject, which is general. So we know that um, the nominative singular masculine uh, word for general is imperator. So we'll do it the real way, the, real, the way that they really would in Latin. So remember, subject, object, verb. Um, we're not going to translate the word my for now. We'll just leave that sort of implied. Um, so we don't need to worry about the. Remember that there's no such thing as the in Latin. The verb is going to come last, so we'll save that for the last thing. So the next thing that will come is the word friend. And what is an accusative singular masculine ending for the word friend? So if you look at your declension chart, um, it's a second declension word. It's accusative singular, so the ending would be U-M. And we know, hopefully, from you, you watched the last lesson, the word for friend is amicus, so it would be amicum. And then I would put this word, sailor, into the same case. So it would also be accusative singular because it is further identifying or describing the word friend. However, the word sailor is in the first declension, right? And so um, an accusative singular ending in the first declension is am, not um. So just make sure, remember that I said, um, so that word would be natam. So again, both of these are in the accusative, but these two nouns just depend, just happen to belong to different declensions, so their endings are slightly different. Um, and then the word praises, well, we'll get into that later, but um, the word for praises is laudat. We'll do a deeper dive into verbs in, uh, in subsequent lessons. Um, so that's what that would look like. Imperator amicum natam dada. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Let's move on. We are going to talk really briefly about the use of the word there. So if you think about the way we use it in English, we use it in a variety of ways. There was a party at my house. Were you there? Um, the same is true in Latin, and it's oftentimes implied. So what I mean by that is. You know, um, one of the things that's kind of hard for English speakers to adjust to when you're learning Latin is you tend to want a one-for-one -one exchange. So you want to translate, if there are four words in a sentence, you want to translate four words in a sentence. But not all languages are like that, uh, especially inflected languages. So you'll notice, you know, for instance, I've said this a couple times, they don't use the word the. So whenever you're translating, you're not going to ever translate the word the. So there are fewer, usually there are fewer words in a Latin sentence than there would be in an English sentence, um, but they're imbued with just as much meaning. So that's kind of the idea behind the word, uh, behind the word there. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll use, um, in the last lesson, remember we, uh, we looked at the various forms of the word to be, sum, s, est, sumus, est, sunt. Sunt literally means they are. So oftentimes they'll use the word sunt to mean there are or there is. And um, it's not always translated. Um, let's see. So, so this means um, in Gaul there are laws. In Gallia sunt leges. So in English, we're, we're missing a word here, right? There are. Um, but in Latin, it's sort of implied. So that's really all that, um, that it means when we sort of talk about the word there being implied. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. If you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Also the bell so you know when a new episode is coming out. Thank you for watching. I will see you in lesson number four.